Good morning, good morning, Hope Well. Family and friends, we welcome you to our Resurrection Sunday of 2024. Want somebody to give God a praise in this house for the wonderful things that he has done. Let us go before the throne of grace for invocation on this morning. Most blessed and heavenly Father, our God, we thank you this morning again for your son, our Savior. God, today we remember and celebrate, especially, specifically today, the resurrected Christ. God, we thank you for his life, for his death. Bless God for his resurrection. God, we ask you this morning that you'll look upon each and every one of these, your people. God, touch us as only you can. God, we ask you because we invite you into our situation. God, we invoke you not only in this place, but in our lives personally, God. God, some are dealing with a dead thing in their lives. But we serve a resurrected Savior. God, things that seem like can't rise, can't work, won't come together. We know that you're able. So we invite you into our circumstance. God, we are your children. We're called by your name. God, we honor you today. We invite you in this house. God, to move by your power and your spirit. God, we come not out for form or fashion or outside show to the world. God, we know no flesh of glory in your sight. So we ask you, omniscient, almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God, not only visit this house this morning in a special way. God, not that you're not at all places at all times. We know you're omnipresent. But we ask you to show up in a way this morning. God, that'll break chains. That'll lift heavy burdens. God, that'll cast down imaginations and thoughts that exalts itself above you, God. Oh, God, we need you. God, the world needs you, God. God, come in this house. God, fill us. Fill us, God. Fill us till we overflow. God, let us be like that shine that sit on a hill that can't be hid. God, the only way this is possible, God, is we allow you in our hearts to do what only you can do. God, bless this service. Bless those that watch virtually, those that are in person. God, bless those who may not even make it out today. God, in a power, God, our pastor, as we know you already have. God, we ask you to invoke your spirit, God, on him even in a mightier way. God, that we may even see the power of God manifested even in new levels. For we grow day to day. God, we invoke your spirit again in this house. Move by your spirit and your power. Blessed Father, have your way. We ask it in no other name other than Jesus the Christ, which is the name. That's above every name. In your son, our Savior name, we ask it. In the church, say amen.
reason he got up because he got up for you and he got up for me he died for all of our sins past present and future aren't you glad today aren't you glad today you got eternal life if you accepted christ he gave you eternal life because of his death we come to celebrate
The heel, heel, heel Sin around me, pain is in me, stress is on me But I gotta keep looking up, tears are streaming Heart is beating, now there's leaving 
But I got a king looking some will trust in horses and chariots. But I will look to the hills and I will not fear. Some may say that they found another way, but my eyes are on you and I will not move from the hill, the hill. has found me pressures crowding people doubting but I gotta keep looking up ground is shaking walls are breaking and my heart is racing but I gotta keep looking some will trust in horses and chariots but I will look to the hill and I will not fear Some may say that they found another way But my eyes are on you And I will not move Whoa, Some may trust in horses and chariots But I will look to the hill And I will not fear No, Some may say that they found another way but my eyes are on you, and I will not move. On the hill, there's a cross. On the cross, there is blood for me, for me. On the hill, there's a cross. On the cross, there is blood for me, <laughs> for me, yeah. Cause on the hill, there's a cross. On the cross, there is blood for me, for me. Cause on the hill, there's a cross. On the cross, there is blood for me, for me. Come on, worship over now. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. What can wash away my sin? Oh, precious, oh, precious, oh, precious is that blood. 
don't discriminate. The cross don't discriminate. The cross don't discriminate. No. There is blood for you. There's blood for you too. After the doctors pronounced me dead, when I fell four floors, my mother, I was, I was four years old and I fell four floors out of a window. My mother, I, I don't know if she just got lost for words, but after calling on the name of Jesus twice, nothing happened. So the third time, man, she just, she just got all the faith she had left. And she screamed, the blood of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I just need about 500 of y'all just to scream, the blood of Jesus. try again. Something rose up in us that said we trust God too much to give up. I don't know who that word is for, but I need you to trust God too much to give up.
is a cross. And on the cross, there is blood just for me. It almost sounds selfish until we realize that God so loved the world. The blood of Jesus Christ was not for a particular nationality of people. But as the song suggested, there is no discrimination when it comes to the cross. Now, I don't know how you all feel about it. I'm trying to hold my composure. But it's hard, amen, when you think about how Jesus died, hung on the cross. The Bible teaches us that he didn't have to do it, but he did. And he loved us not because of, but in spite of. Now, I don't want to act like I'm the worst person in here, but just to have died for my sins would have been fair for Jesus to experience what he experienced. But when we think about all of the sins of the world were draped upon him, and how can we show up on Resurrection Sunday and not give him all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise? Yes, the blood still works, y'all. I said the blood still works and it will never lose its power. So we can always lift our eyes to the hill. The psalmist said we can look beyond the hill from which cometh our help. All of our help comes from the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Give it up for this liturgical dance ministry. Come on, y'all. Come on. Bless them. Bless them. Amen. What a, what a wonderful presentation. Go ahead and receive the presence of the Lord. Uh, let me, before I forget, appreciate uh, little sister Henry. Amen. Sister Henry, is, I remember she was as small as the liturgical dance, the dancers that were in the front. And now she, the Lord is blessing her to be able to do choreography. Amen. Uh, for a long time, I didn't know any better. I thought, uh, no, no slight on Sister World, but I thought it was Sister World that was coming up with all these magnificent, youthful spins and turns, karate kicks. And then I learned it was little Sister Henry. So whenever she gets out of her liturgical dance regalia, we want to take a moment to, to appreciate her. Amen. Listen, let's give it up for this mass choir. Now, I actually thought that they sung out of their minds on Friday evening, but then came Sunday. Amen. Good Friday was one thing, amen, but it's Resurrection Sunday that causes Good Friday to be called good. And so the way you all have sung this morning, amen, giving us the waiting congregation, everything that God had given unto you. You know, I believe that that's what serving God ought to be about. Not serving him on our own, you know, uh, conditions. But we, we serve him because we're grateful for the privilege. Amen. To sing for the Lord. Imagine people uh, in the entertainment business, that they're, they're really singing for money, y'all. They, they, they call their fans their fans. But you, you try to roll up on one of them in a public place and you see how much of a fan you are. Amen. But, but when we serve God, we serve God because we, we love him. And when we see the spirit of excellence in the presentation of the choir and this liturgical dance ministry, amen, we, 
should be grateful that the people of God take serving God seriously. Amen. So let me just thank God this morning again and say happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. 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 Let me just appreciate the love of my life. Amen, Sister Aileen Evelyn Stanley. I told a fellow a few days ago I don't suffer from having to fraternize with anybody. God has blessed me with a hip meet. Amen. That can talk about more than just the mundane things. And so because she able to meet me on those levels of which I need, and that is I just need somebody to help me understand what God is talking about. And if I, if I seek counsel from someone else, they may be envious of what God is doing in my life and they may not give me good instructions. Well, Sister Stanley knows to give me good, bad instructions is to give herself bad instructions. And she's not going to do that. But we appreciate her so much. Amen. She told me this morning, Sister Pierce, that I, she was the absolute best thing next to Jesus that has ever happened to me. And normally, Sister, Sister Cipriana, you need somebody to second that, right? And so, so I went ahead and seconded it because I, I, I agree with her 100%. That whatever God has allowed me to become, she has certainly been instrumental in that. Listen, let's keep lifting up our assistant pastor in prayer. Amen. God is strengthening his body to bring him back to the congregation. The Lord would have me this morning to give him a personal call and to say to him, uh, happy uh, Resurrection Sunday. And so we know that he is, uh, God is recovering him, strengthening him. So keep Reverend Stevenson, Sister Stevenson, and the Stevenson family Amen. In your prayer, I know that they are viewing this morning. Amen. Reverend Stevenson, Pastor Stanley, and the Hopewell family, we love you to life. Amen. Come on, Hopewell. And then, of course, we have another one of our stalwart leaders, amen, who's recovering, uh, Deacon Marvin Lowe, chairman of our executive board, had a chance to visit with him. God is strengthening his body as well. Amen. And I know that he is viewing the service as well. So, Deke, you know, man, we love you to life. Hope well and I. Hope well. Let's appreciate. Amen. Deacon Marvin Lowe and Sister Lowe. Listen, we just thank God this morning, amen, for the privilege uh, to stand before you once again and declare God's holy and divine word. Now, to all of our deacons, you know we love you. Thank you for your support. Amen. Uh, we training some deacons and what is so wonderful is that uh, Deacon Pierce and I and those deacons, Deacon Lowe who've been a part of the Zoom uh, we're helping them to understand that they're not the front offensive line for me. I'm not uh, uh, who's the top popular quarterback well let me just go with a tour since I'm a Dolphin fan Amen you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need nobody to protect me from immorality and when I mess up to say, act like I didn't mess up. I just need somebody to help me, amen, uh, uh, to keep me from messing up, amen, by standing alongside of me. And so we want to thank God for all of the deacons, amen, to who God is preparing for this moment. Now listen, Hope Well, I'm going to get you out of here because let me tell you something. If I didn't have that much to say, I would let this wonderful, powerful prayer through Elder Clark and the powerful presentation of the mass choir and the liturgical dance ministry be all the ministering we need this morning. But just in case somebody said, Reverend, God said I was going to get all of that and, and that much. You heard me say this before and it bears repeating and that is every Resurrection Sunday, pastors all over the country find themselves being challenged to preach a 
familiar narrative in a fresh and unique way. Now, I'm not one of those pastors who are so pressured that they would almost come close to desecrating the celebration of the resurrection. I know you've heard of those who, in an effort to do something different, will even allow the influence of the culture to try and represent the Christ. Now, I, I'll admit to you that we do have a responsibility, a responsibility to preach the word of God and allow it to be engaging and to allow it to be compelling. But we should never be tempted to commit heresy to be so desperate to, in this new climate that we're in, uh, to get likes until you pour syrup on the Bible, Lord. Uh, you, you, you'll do something outlandish for sharp treatment. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I know that uh, the resurrection story may have its familiarity in your experience, but don't let its familiarity rob you of the relevance for your life. This is not just another Resurrection Sunday that we're gathering together or even a gathering where we're coming together to just have church. Every time we come in God's presence, we ought to come to hear what God has to say to me. Not, not, not to my wife, not, not to my neighbor, not to my, my siblings. But, but what God has to say to, to me. And so your pastor is not going to commit heresy. Well, y'all would have to determine that. Uh, uh, but I do want to call your attention to a very familiar passage of scripture found in the gospel according to St. John. Chapter number 20. And, you know, I'm going to walk a bit. Um, I'm going to try to do the best I can, amen, to, to bless us this morning with a word that will really challenge us to make sure that we leave this place better than when we came. These are the words we find written by the Apostle John. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. And we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believe. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10 says, Then the disciples went away again unto their own homes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for this reflective moment that you've given us to be reminded not only of your redemptive death 
but your resurrection power. Pray now, God, as I always do, that you would speak with my mouth, think with my mind. Lord me now into your storehouse of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Pray now, God, for the recipients of your word, those who have come, who have gathered to hear from you, that you would allow your word, God, not to go out into their hearts void, but allow them to be receptive to receive it. For you've already left on record that it will not go out void, but it always accomplishes the purpose in which you have sent it. So we thank you now, Father. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. We ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and the people of God said, Amen. I want to lift the subject from verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. I, I want to talk about responding to the reality of the resurrection responding to the reality of the resurrection. Again, it is no secret that the Christian faith is really based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, we would go as far as saying it is paramount. The Apostle Paul helps us to understand how important our Christian faith is as it relates to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 and 17, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain. Our faith also is vain. And we are yet in sin. Therefore, the foundation of the Christian faith rests upon this reality that Jesus died, he was buried, and on the third day, he rose from the grave. And the Bible teaches us that everyone that that, that makes this confession that Jesus is Lord and believe in his redemptive death and the power of his resurrection shall be saved. Now, 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 I know you know all the scripture because Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The hard man believe unto righteousness with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. So basically, Reverend, you can pretty much say that this whole idea of the celebration, every year when we come together, it is all about uh, you and I being exposed and reacquainted with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, it is possible to be exposed and to be reacquainted with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not be affected and not respond. Now, I'm not trying to, trying to bother nobody, but it is possible that you can show up and be told the facts that are really indisputable, that Jesus did in fact get up and yet leave unresponsive. In fact, some of you looking at me this morning, you go, I'm going to check out for a minute, but you'll check back in. Because you haven't grown beyond thinking that every time God speaks to you, the preacher is talking about you. You're important in your world, but you ain't important like that in my world. 
But it's possible that, that there are many sitting and even viewing in the virtual space who have attended Easter services year after year and yet have not been affected or have responded to the resurrection. Now, I'm not trying to read your mail or anything like that because the truth is if a person actually is exposed or even reacquainted with the indisputable facts of the resurrection, it is absolutely no way they will be unaffected and not respond to the resurrection, therefore becoming believers of Christ Jesus. So then, having gotten all the hard work out of the way, I want to say to those of you who are in person and in the virtual space, I want to challenge you to carefully and earnestly consider these indisputable facts concerning the resurrection and, 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 and please don't, don't leave this place without being affected by not what Stanley has to say, but by what God has to say. And I believe we find this in the text. Now, I'm just kind of saturated a little bit with this word, so I may just go hither and hither. Here's what the verse, verse number one says to us. Verse number one says basically, ah, uh, the first day of the week, for those of us who work, we think Monday is the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. So it says, on the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, to the sepulcher. The word early is interesting because it is a technical word among our Jewish brothers and sisters to give reference to the four different times, uh, night watches, I should say. This particular watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Everything's quiet. For those of you who do early morning uh, meditation or getting up early in the morning, you know that that is a quiet time. In fact, if you have problems even hearing yourself, getting up early in the morning, things are quiet. God can speak. But in this instance, it was quiet not just because Mary got up. It was quiet because of everything that had happened on Friday. And you all know what happened. Jesus was stripped of his garment, severely beaten over his body, Ah, uh, he was slapped on his cheek, spat in his face. He was crowned with thorns, and he was nailed to a cross. If that wasn't enough, if I could use my feeble, sanctified imaginations, the entire universe acknowledged this cruel treatment of our Savior. And the Bible says that the sun and the moon decided to hide its face. And then the earth, don't nobody go get them to drink, but the earth was intoxicated with the grief that it rocked and reeled like a drunk man. After Jesus hung on the cross for six hours and then seven utterances, the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. Then we are told that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they, 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 they went to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. And we are told that the women watched as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea wrapped the body of Jesus with every intent of placing him in Joseph's of Arimathea's brand new tomb. The Bible suggests, or history suggests, and we'll see in the synoptic gospels that Mary was watching along with other women 
as uh, uh, Nicodemus and, and Joseph was wrapping the body of Jesus until the trumpet blast. The trumpet blast indicating that the Sabbath had began. Therefore, they left going home because, you know, on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to be doing anything. So Mary waits until uh, the second blast. The second blast indicated that the Sabbath was over and Sunday began. And that's when we are told that Mary, John's account, that Mary gets up early in the morning and she comes to the sepulchre, Mary Magdalene. Now, there's a whole lot of choice words. Depends on how compromised a pastor is to describe the condition that Jesus found Mary Magdalene in because we saw the children dancing this morning and I'm not trying to get likes. But Mary Magdalene was a woman of the night. Mary was messed up because there's something about going from city to city. Help me, Holy Ghost. From chamber to chamber, somewhere along the line, she didn't just pick up Sister Jones, one, one devil. Not, not, not just two devils. But Jesus delivered her from seven devils. Number seven suggests complete. We might say that she was completely possessed. And I thought about that thing. When Brown, I said, hey, that's the only kind of possession you can be. And when the, when the devil is involved, you're not partially possessed. Amen. You are completely possessed. But here is what is so powerful about Mary is that she shows us Whenever you have been delivered from God, you can't help but dedicate yourself to him and to a life of faithfulness. I ain't trying to bother nobody, but, but what really separates people and their faithfulness to God is how God and what God has delivered them from. Now, I ain't trying to bother nobody because I know some of us think when we hear the testimonies of others that they are being braggadocious of how God brought them back from death and delivered them from alcohol and drugs and a life of lasciviousness. Well, the, the operative word is that they were delivered. Everybody need to be delivered from something. So the problem here, and this is the free, is just coming to me. Uh, the problem here is if, if you are short on uh, a, a testimony of deliverance, it's because you won't let God deliver you. Ain't, ain't nobody better than you, but, but, but some of us just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. We, we just got tired of trying to run with the hare and hunt with the hound. Some of us realized that until we surrendered our life to God, that things were not going to change. We understood that we can't dip and dab in unrighteousness and then expect God to open the windows of heaven and pour us out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. So Mary Magdalene says, I don't, I don't care if the men are not going to show up. Mary, Mary said, this ain't even a private testimony. Say, the word is out. Everybody know what God delivered me from. But here's what, here's what John doesn't tell us that the synoptic gospels do tell us, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us that Mary really wasn't by herself. In fact, the synoptic gospels suggest that Mary, the mother of James the less, was there as well. Also, uh, Joanna, who is uh, the wife of uh, Herod Stewart, was there. Salome and other women were there at the tomb. In fact, when you look at verse number two in our text, it says, uh, we don't know. She, she was referencing the fact that there were other women there with us. So we, we don't know where they laid him. 
Here is what we're told. Those women, I got to hurry up, I know it. These women, they were coming to the tomb. While they were coming to the tomb, Brother Gilliam, the question was raised. Who's going to move the stone? I mean, I know we, I know we, I know we're, we, we need to get there and, and finish the anointing of the body of Jesus, but who's going to move the stone? Can I suggest to you, when you are on God's, doing God's business, don't worry about obstacles. Don't, don't worry about who's going to be there and who's not going to be there. Always know that nothing moves without God being involved. And don't think so small of yourself that just maybe God don't want the rest of them to be there. Maybe God just wants you to be there. Who's to suggest that your being in the place is not significant if there's not a crowd to endorse your flesh that says it must be, I must be a part of something big because it's big. That was for free. He shows up. They say, listen, who's going to move? Obstacles don't matter. What are we going to do with greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? So they make their way to the tomb and to their surprise when they get there, stone has already been rolled away. Matthew says in 28 uh, chapter verse number two talks about when they showed up uh, that the gods were lying down as if they were dead. They looked in, saw that Jesus was not there. Then the angels said to them, go and tell the disciples. And so when we come here to uh, uh, John's account, John now is showing us that Mary Magdalene and the women, that they ran and came to the disciples. In fact, Mark thought it was important to indicate in Mark 16 and 7 The angel told them, and also tell Peter, amen. So here's what happens. I ain't trying to bother nobody, amen, Sister Holmes. I do want the record to be straight, though, because, you know, sometimes we don't always keep the record straight. And and here is the the straightness of the record. The Bible said that the women were carrying a message to the disciples. Now, I I don't read that. I I know what a sermon means. And it didn't say that they took a sermon. It said that they took a message. Now, I'm saying that for this reason because we all know that everybody in the body of Christ has been given the ministry of reconciliation. And we don't have to say stuff in the Bible that's not in there. Just tell it like it is. And the Bible said they brought this message. Amen. People have brought me messages. They didn't preach no sermon to me. Come back, sisters. Three quick things I'm done with you I want to talk about. First of all, let's look at the report of the resurrection. If you let me use my sanctified imagination, here is what it simply suggests. Uh, that, that, that Mary runs, she cometh to Peter and the other disciple, of course, you careful Bible readers know that the other disciple is none other than John. So he comes to Peter and the other disciple and basically says to them that we have gone to the sepulcher and they have taken Jesus and we don't know where they have laid him. The Bible says around verse number four that they both began to run toward the sepulcher. The skinny of it is that she said to them that Jesus is missing. Those are three words that we have a problem acknowledging. We let all kind of people try to make us think that they're doing the Jesus thing, that they're walking and they're serving according to what the word says. But sometimes we don't really want to say Jesus is missing. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have a melodious voice. I'm not saying that you are not a great orator. I'm not saying that you are a, you're not a great person that serves in the church. But, but when I look at your life, it doesn't, doesn't look like Jesus is, there. Jesus is missing. And, 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 and it's easy for some of us. I mean, I mean, you know, 
if you see me on the, on the dance floor getting down, dropping it like it's hot, I, I don't need nobody to tell me that I know Jesus is missing. You taking off your earrings and taking off your hair and talking about you going to straighten somebody out. Don't you know Jesus is missing. And we act just like we see Jesus. He's missing. They said he was missing. I'm going to hurry up and So, so let's look at calling a confusing report, and I'll tell you why. Because by the time the women make it to the disciples, they sound kind of confusing. For example, when you look at Matthew 28 and 6 and Mark 16 and 6, it kind of says there that the angels told the women that Jesus was alive from the dead. But then when we listen to uh, Mary Magdalene speaking now uh, to Peter uh, in our text, she says, they've taken the Lord and we, we don't know where they've laid him. It almost sounds a, a little confusing. And then when you go back to Matthew around the 28th chapter, verse number 6, it kind of suggests that after the experience they had with the angel, they departed quickly, and it said that they were filled with fear and great joy when they went to the disciples. So it almost sounds like they don't know which, which way is up, what is going on. The message even sounds a little confusing. And that's why we understand that the synoptic gospels have to be read, amen, chronologically so that we can understand that while there may be different perspectives of the same experience or, or, or event, when you put them together, it is not confusing. Basically, they were saying to John and Peter, I should say, and John, listen, he has been removed, but we don't know where he, they have laid him. Confusing and a little fearful. I thought about this, uh, Sister Fulton, and I thought about how fear can distort, amen, uh, uh, and cause one to be confused. Now, I know in actuality the text, the word says they were left with fear. I want to argue that it was a great reverence, but here's for, the, for my purpose. So sometimes you can allow the fear of a thing to confuse w w what you're trying to articulate. Listen, you're just trying to tell somebody that you need some help. I know you are afraid that you're going to lose whatever it is that you have, but don't tell people all you need is some temporary assistance. Oh, this is for free. Listen, nobody says on Thursday, give me what I need and I'll pay you Friday. If that's going to work for me, it'll work for the person you owe. That was for free. Y'all didn't like that. So here it is. Fear produces confusion. And I believe with all of my heart the Bible says they were confused. How do I know? When you look at Luke 24 and 11, here's what it says. Their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. The word idle in the Greek simply means nonsense, idle talk. Babel, delirium. Well, we know in John's account, that's not what happened. We know that something got lost in translation. And that's why we must be careful when we are trying to uh, give a message that we, that we do not add to try to embellish it or to exaggerate it. Amen. You ain't catch no fish this big. Oh, I didn't say that right. You ain't catch no fish this long. So here's what he's saying. Watch this now. Why, why, why are you talking about this confusing piece, Reverend? Because this is some, some of what the devil used in the hearts of people. That, that church stuff is confusing. 
I listen to one reverend and he says, drinking is all right. I listen to another reverend and he says, no, it's not. I listen to one reverend and he says, I can go and do whatever I want to do because God's grace is sufficient. And I listen to another reverend and says, no, 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 no. That's not how you behave with grace. So sometimes I'm confused about what God really says in his word as it relates to the resurrection. So here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The apostle Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. Here's what he says, for I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I have received. Watch this, how Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Watch this, and was buried and, he was, and, and that he rose according to the scriptures, not according to Stanley. But according to the scripture, so what are you saying, Reverend? As you're sitting here this morning, you are examining these indisputable facts. You need to know that the message or the report is not confusing. And I promise you, as we continue, I will unpack it even the more. Watch this. The report was also, in my opinion, it was a, a convicting report. The Bible says it this way. When Peter and John heard what the woman said, it said they went forth. The word went forth seemed to suggest that before the woman could stop telling them what happened, or in this case Mary, they started running toward the sepulcher. I want to show you something because I think it's very, very, very powerful. They took off running toward the sepulcher with the same level of conviction the same awareness. But as they begin to run, what we discover is that their convictions were a little different. Because when they first start running, John, or they're running together, and at some point, John pulls away. He pulls away from, from Peter. Now, as you know, John makes it to the tomb. He looks inside, the text says he saw but he stood on the outside. Here come Peter. Y'all know him. Peter is the impulsive one. <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter is the one uh, that is prone to error. John is a more, uh, he's the meditative one. He's, he's, he's more prone to a reflection. But Peter runs in. But here it is. The question is, well, Reverend, what is the difference between John and and Peter, you telling me they both had convictions, they were running together, but all of a sudden, John went ahead of Peter. First of all, John, as you know, the Bible teaches us, was considered the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ. John loved Jesus, if you will, more than any of them. It, will, it can be suggested. In John 18 and 15, we're told that during the interrogation, as well as the sentencing, guess who was still hanging around? John. In fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, according to the 19th chapter, verses 20, let me show you, 19th chapter, verses 26 and 27, who was near the cross? It was John. Who did Jesus put uh, his mother in care of? It was John. So John was faithful, man, and John wanted to get to Jesus because he knew how much he loved Jesus. And let me tell you something, when you love him like that, you'll do everything in your power to get to him. Now, now some folks say that when John made it to the tomb, he didn't go in because he had lost, uh, he was trying to catch his breath. Yeah, they say, well, John was a little exhausted. He had ran real fast. He was trying to catch his breath. Others say, no, nah, John, because he's very, you know, reflective, thought maybe this was a, some kind of trap that the Romans had, amen, to try and capture the disciples. But here's what we know. John understood that love was connected to action. They tell folk you love them and then don't have any action. In fact, John records in the 14th chapter, verse number 15, Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. There is something that, that love is, is, is handcuffed to doing something. Oh, I love Sister Stanley. Let me say it this way. I love Lena. Amen. And guess what? I can change my voice any kind of way I want to. I can, I can accompany that voice with some nice jazz, some nice music, amen. I can set the ambiance and make it real romantic, amen. But if I don't do something, amen. 
This is for free, Brother Jackson. I didn't say if I don't buy something. If I don't do something. Let me try that again. I got some sisters there. I'm, I'm trying to deliver y'all like Mary Magdalene. Not if I don't buy her anything. But there's a, we all have a honey do. Oh, y'all don't, y'all don't like this? Yeah. Every now and then, Sister Stanley tells me, it ain't about what I can buy her, it's what, it's what she wants me to do. But I'm a 24-7, 365 day of the year pastor. I don't, you know, I don't have it like that. But yeah, but you were, you were my, you were my husband. Amen. And, and it's God, family, and ministry. And you can't save the world and save everybody else's marriage. And the honey-do list. I'm going somewhere. So, so it's because of love. So it was John's love that caused him to run so quickly. I got to hurry up because y'all put him in the teaching mode and I ain't, I ain't trying to stay there. Here it is. But then look at Peter. Now, John shows us how he was hasty to get there. But for Peter, he was kind of hesitant. Because you're not going to make me believe that Peter did not want to get to that tomb as fast as John. But somewhere along the line as they were running and conviction started kicking in, unlike John, who had in his mind of his last time looking at the Savior, was receiving instructions to take care of his mother, Peter had denied him. And all of a sudden, the closer he got to Jesus, or at least the tomb, he realized the kind of failure he was the last time he encountered the face of Jesus. Now, we know that Peter wasn't scared of nobody. <laughs> Let me get the verse for you, because over in John 18 and 10, Peter cut off Malchus' ear. One of, the, one of the priest's servants. Now, he wasn't scared of nobody. He wasn't scared like that. He, he, he would cut you. But watch this. But watch this. His, his vision had been clouded with his failure. And sometimes, y'all, the report of Jesus to Christ, it can, it can, it can, distort your vision because you're thinking about your failures. Can I submit to you that none of us in here, from Pastor Stanley to the door, is perfect. The scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none of us in our resume that does not have several lines that speaks of our failures and our shortcomings. If you and I could not come to the Lord after we fail, guess what? You would not have had me standing up here pastoring you for over 34 years. So Peter have, helps us to understand, even though you may have failed him, even though you started out, amen, in the Sunshine Bible band, even though you were a faithful choir member, you were faithful to the usher board, you served the church, and now you're looking at me, be it in person or in the virtual space, and the devil is trying to tell you, amen, you are filled with failure. I'm here to tell you, God looks beyond all of our faults. Yes, he does. Here's what the psalmist says in 86 and 5. I'm going to hurry up and push. It says, for thou, Lord, watch this, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them, there it is, that call upon thee. God says, I got it for you, but you got to call on me. You got to acknowledge it and then confess it. Bring all your burdens, all your troubles, all your trials. To the, that's what the resurrection is all about, bringing your troubles and your trials to the Lord. Let me race through this second point. Call this the revelation of the resurrection. Y'all already know what happens. They show up 
At the tomb, they get there. Peter goes in. John is still on the outside. But John has peeked in, saw what Mary conveyed to them. But of course, they both witnessed the fact that Jesus was missing. Let me walk through this and get to the good stuff. First thing we see I want to share with you is the appearance of the grave clothes. The Bible says, Peter looks in and he seeth, right? He seeth the linen clothes lying. Well, first let me say, John went in, see the, the linen clothes lie, but he did not go inside. It's important he said he saw there. The word saw is quite interesting. It just simply means that he gave a glance. John just kind of looked in, got back out, amen, and then, of course, thought about immediately for a second what he had seen. When you look at this word, saw, again, it just simply makes reference to the fact that he just kind of looked and saw the linen cloth. Now, it's believed that this was a very expensive Egyptian garment uh, that Joseph of Arimathea used to wrap the body of Jesus, which also argues the fact that if the body had been stolen, right, they would not have just taken the body and left that expensive garment. If you don't think I'm telling you the truth, leave your Louis Vuitton somewhere Come back and all your money is out, but the, but, the, but the pocketbook is there. But note now, when it came to Peter, the Bible says in verse 6 that when Peter went in, it said that Peter went in and he seeth. He looked and he began to, if you will, investigate. The word seeth is where we get our word theater. It means that he went in and he fully and carefully looked at every nook and cranny inside of the tomb. Don't miss this, very important. He looked and saw everything that was inside the tomb. He saw actually the linen and the fact that the napkin was put in another place altogether. He looked at everything. So we see the appearance of the clothes, then there is the arrangement. I just told you the arrangement, basically, they walk in, they see, amen, the garment is in one place, the napkin, amen, that was on the head of Jesus, it is sitting in another place. So Peter investigates, he looks at it, he sees everything, amen, he sees it wrapped up, neatly, put in a particular place. Now, I race through that because here's where I want to get before I lose you. Here it is. I think I see what you're saying, Reverend. So they show up, we see the appearance, we see the arrangement. So that is the revelation of the resurrection is that they saw that the body of Jesus was gone. Missing. So let's look at Peter and John. Let's look at their response. And no matter how you feel about where you're seated this morning, you're either looking through the eye, the, through the glasses of a John or a Peter. Let me show it to you. Here it is. I call this the response to the resurrection. Verse 8 simply says, And then went in the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believe. Let me say this. The resurrection, it ought to, y'all, cause every person to respond. You are going to respond this morning. Here it is. Let's look at Peter. Peter looked inside of the tomb and it produced what I call uncertain feelings. What do you mean, Reverend? He saw it. He saw the way it was arranged. He knew based on what he had witnessed that Jesus was not there. But the problem with Peter is that he just saw something. Peter did not see enough, y'all, that would cause him to believe, don't miss this, that Jesus was alive. Y'all looking at me funny. 
Peter, yes, I'm talking about impulsive, prone to error Peter who looks in, the word seeth, and he examines and investigates everything and says there is no Jesus. But yet nothing happened to convince him that Jesus was alive. Look at verse, look at, look at Luke 24 and 12, and I'll be almost out your way. Here's what it says. That Peter really departed wondering to himself, if I can stand it rise, what actually happened. He departed, says, in himself at that which had come to pass. He left saying, he said, what? what's this? What has happened? He has shown up. He has been exposed to the empty tomb. He see the evidence of the cloth. But yet he leaves saying to himself, what is this? Many of you are seated right here this morning and you're hearing the gospel being preached and the question that's being raised right now for you is whether or not you're being affected by the empty tomb. Whether or not you're going to respond like Peter or, as we shall see in a moment, like John. Oh, yeah, it's possible that you could come to church Sunday after Sunday. You could come to church Easter after Easter. You could hear the Easter story. You could hear the gospel being preached and yet not be affected. How dare you try to push it off on the service? How dare you try to push it off on the preacher? The preacher don't save you. The singing don't save you. It is the word of God that saves us. It is believing in the redemptive death of Jesus the Christ that saves us. How many times have we come to the house of the Lord and been recipients of God delivering us and rescuing us and saving us, and yet we leave unaffected? even though sometimes individuals have not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. But because of the prayers of the righteous, God has blessed your life through theirs. There's always a reason to respond, but let me tell you what happens, and I hope it's none of you. What can very well happen is what we read in John 12 and 40. Here's what happens. John is recording something that Isaiah said, and Isaiah said this in well, John. John said this in reference, Jesus rather said this in reference to what happened in, in, in Isaiah's day. He basically says that they have blinded their eyes and hidden their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts to be converted and I should heal them. The message Bible says it this way, their eyes are blind. Their hearts are hardened so that they wouldn't see with their eyes or perceive with their hearts and turn to me, God, so I could heal them. What are you saying, Reverend? Do you not know we can come and hear the gospel preach until the gospel is hid from us? And it's hid from those, watch this, who know not the gospel? Watch this now. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, here's what it says. But if the gospel be hid, it is hid from them, watch this, that are lost. If you come to the house of the Lord, you hear the word of God preach. If you are a person who have not heard the word to the point of being hardened by the word, there's nothing worse than to find someone who are living on narratives of the Bible who are living on parts and pieces of the Bible, who are living on something that they heard someone else say to them, who believes, amen, that you can just do any and everything you want to do as long as you say, I love the Lord. I told you already, love is not just something that we do with our mouth. It is something that we do with our life. Listen to what he says. He says, watch this now. In that whom, in whom the God of this world, don't miss this, have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. The world has a way of blinding us. One of the challenges that pastors are faced with is simply this. Do we give in to the world or do we stand on the word? People are blinded by the world. So what are you saying, Reverend? 
So that means that the recommendations that, that I could potentially get from, from those who are part of members of this church is some secular, cultural movement that you see, that you think, opposite word, is the new church. There is no new church. He says, if the gospel be hid, you are blinded by the world. Look at the things that are happening in the world that we will be canceled if we say anything about. Yeah, and then have the nerve to say, and then and we got the Bible and say, you know, they, they, they don't do that no more. That ain't how it is no more. No, God don't, listen, the Bible says, the loving kindness have I drawn thee. But the world can blind us so much so until we think if we say something that is not in, uh, not the perspective of the world, then somehow we are antiquated. That's crazy. That's ludicrous. What it is is people hearing the word of God and not being affected. How dare any of us entertain anybody, anybody that says the church is whacked. First of all, you don't even, you need to go find the Lord. All of a sudden, you showed up when you showed up and think God had to wait for you to show up so we can know about church. And the reality is simply this. They are blinded by the world. And that's why they're not affected. That's why they can, we can dip and dab in anything. There is no conviction. There has to be something, I told you already a few moments uh, the other Sunday, there has to be something inside of a believer for you to be convicted to say that, listen, how you saved and talking about it don't bother you not to come to church? And the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. The world told some of us, you ain't got to go to church. God is everywhere. He is. He's omnipresent, but he's missing in you. Y'all ain't liking me, I know. This is the wrong business to be in to be liked. So he simply says, watch this. Peter saw all that stuff. Think about it. How can someone come to church, hear the word of God preach, pray, the emphasis is not on anything but the word and God, and yet we leave and go back to the same stuff. Now I ain't saying if you're living in a relationship or you practicing without license, marriage license that is, that you should go home and tell the person, you know, we got to, you know, I, the, the, don't tell them the pastor say we can't stay together no more. <laughs> say, God said through the pastor. But I'm going somewhere. I'm not saying that you got to go home and, you know, get all your stuff, start packing your stuff and leave. But if this word has affected you, you should be making preparations. Amen. Listen, I know people, you know them too, that have done things that they know that was not right. God has convicted their heart. And guess what? They did something about it. And if you don't feel nothing, that is not a surprise to people who know God. But you need to understand that you can come to church because your heart has been hardened and there's no change happening. It means like Peter, you can walk into the tomb, you can see all of the living that prove that Jesus has resurrected, and we're going to deal with it, I'm done, and then you and I should act according to what we find. Okay, so let's get to John and let me let y'all go home and Talk about what Pastor Stanley said, not what God said. So Peter produces uncertain feelings. Peter saw all that stuff, and the Bible said he walked away. The most sad words is verse number 10. What verse the number 10 talks about, it says that he left, went home, amen, um, 
and was unaffected by what he saw. All that blood singing we heard this morning, liturgical dance ministry telling us about the hill. On the hill there's a cross, on the cross there's blood. For me, and I know I'm wrong, I know I ain't what I ought to be. Amen. And then y'all tell me sometimes, that Reverend, you hold us in church so long. I'm trying to hold some of y'all to keep y'all from going back. <laughs> y'all ain't, okay. Okay, let me, let, me, let me finish this and get y'all out of here. Brother Carlton, I might need your help because I'm, so here it is. So, so let's look at John. Because when we look at John, what happens is, uh, 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 for John, it produced unwavering faith. Not rocket, this is not rocket science. Here's what it says. Then went the other disciple who got to the sepulcher first. It said he saw and believed. Now watch this. Peter seeth in the theater looking with his little knows himself, looking and see everything. Then he leaves out, but he does not believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. The Bible says, watch this, but John goes in and it says he saw. Now the word saw is a little different here than it is in verse 5. Verse 5, it talks about just a glance. Here it's a little different. It's really talking about perceiving and understanding. It is talking about grasping and comprehending. You see, when John saw the appearance of the clothes, or I should say the, the, the linen clothes and the arrangement, he knew based on the arrangement, watch this, that Jesus had risen from the dead. It was enough evidence for him to believe that Jesus was alive. Here it is. So what's the evidence, Reverend? Because John had heard the prophecy over and over again that Jesus gave foretelling his death and his resurrection. So now he is in the tomb. He sees that the body of Jesus has been resurrected and immediately he believes. Now, there are some who may suggest that when Jesus got up out of the grave. Some say that he got up and or sat up, took off the nice garment that he had on, I should say grave linen that he had on and then took the napkin and placed it on the side. Well, that's what someone would probably do if they're not God. In, in, that's just my opinion. I believe that what, what really happened, if you could let me use my little bit of sanctified imagination, that he levitated. I, I believe that Jesus just floated on through. Y'all ain't liking me. I think he just floated on through the grave clothes and then he just took the napkin and put it in another place. Now, you might think that I'm borderlining heresy. But remember now, when you read over in John 20 and 29, it's kind of interesting because, or rather not 20 and 29, but over where the Bible tells us when Jesus 20, yeah, 20 and, let me get it right because I got to get it right. Well, you know what? I know I'm, I'm looking right. That's why I don't like to look all the time. But let me say it this way. You know what's there. You remember when Jesus showed up at the house where the disciples were hanging out. But the Bible said that Jesus was not bound by material substance. The Bible said that Jesus just walked on through the door. And, and, and so since that's what happened in the case of Jesus, 
Uh, then, then we know that he did not need to get up and take off his clothes. But when John saw that Jesus was no longer in the grave, the Bible said that he believed. You see, whenever you hear the word of God preached and you believe the preaching of the word of God, you don't need nobody to force you. You don't need nobody to make you. But because John remembered what Jesus said, Jesus said to John, and not only John, but to also to his disciples, said, listen, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to a skull-shaped hill called Calvary. And I'm going to die on that hill but I want you to know that my death will not be concluded on the hill. He said because they're going to tear up or, or destroy this temple. But in three days, I'm going to build it up again. So when John walked inside of the tomb and he recognized that Jesus was no longer there, immediately he was affected by what he saw. And I don't know about you, but many years ago, I showed up in the church. And I heard the preacher preach the word of God. And he said unto me, there's only two places that has been prepared. He said, God has prepared a place for his people. And there is a place that's prepared for those who will reject him. And I heard the preacher say that you don't have to go to the place that is called Hades but rather you can go to the place that is called heaven and so the Bible helps me to understand that when I heard that as the old hymn would say I came to Jesus just as I was I was wounded weary and sad but I found in him a resting place and he has uh, he has made me glad uh, I heard Jesus say to John uh, he said to Thomas rather he said blessed uh, are they that see and believe uh, but then I heard him say but for those uh, who have not seen uh, and believed uh, how blessed are they uh, and I stop by to tell you you don't have to see uh, you don't have to see Jesus to believe him uh, there are a whole lot of witnesses uh, that are right here in the church uh, in fact many of us are here today uh, because of somebody that gave their life to Christ uh, they saw you out there dipping and dabbing uh, and when you came over on the Lord's side uh, they said God must be real uh, I remember he was on the dance floor uh, I remember he was on the corner uh, I remember she was in the club uh, but look at her now uh, because they realize uh, that when you come in contact with the Lord uh, you cannot uh, you cannot remain the same uh, I gotta get out of here now uh, but here is the reality uh, he remembered uh, what Jesus had said. Uh, so here we are uh, on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but we were only a few days ago uh, celebrating Good Friday. Uh, what happened, Reverend? Uh, you know the story. Uh, Jesus took a six by nine, uh, went up to Galgantha's Hill, uh, and there he died. Uh, they took Jesus. Uh, put him in the bar or two uh, stay there uh, all night Saturday night and Friday night and early Sunday morning uh, got up uh, with all power in his hand uh, but can I tell you this uh, he didn't finish there uh, it was not over uh, there was a reason uh, that Jesus levitated uh, 
through his clothes, uh, there was a reason uh, that Jesus took the napkin uh, and folded uh, in a separate place. Uh, you see, he wasn't finished yet. Uh, you see, the Hebrews uh, have a tradition uh, in those homes uh, where the masters uh, have servants. Uh, when they would have dinner, uh, and if they got up, from the dinner table uh, and they took their napkin uh, and they waddled it up uh, and placed it on the plate. Uh, it meant uh, that the master uh, was not coming back uh, and it was okay uh, for them to clean off the table. Uh, but uh, if the master got up uh, from the table, uh, took his napkin, uh, wrapped it up, uh, folded it rather uh, nice and neat, uh, and put it next uh, to his plate, uh, it really meant uh, that he was coming back, uh, he was coming back again. Uh, may I suggest to you, uh, when you look uh, into the tomb, uh, and you see uh, the napkin folded, uh, it's our Savior uh, telling us uh, he's coming, uh, he's coming back again. Uh, maybe uh, I'm in it by myself, uh, but the good news is uh, he's coming back, uh, and until uh, he come back, uh, I encourage you uh, to join me uh, in telling the world uh, I serve uh, a risen Savior. Uh, he's in uh, the world today. Uh, I know uh, he's living uh, no matter uh, what men may say. Uh, I see uh, his hand of mercy. Uh, I hear uh, his voice of cheer. Uh, and every time uh, that I need him, uh, he's always, uh, he's always near. Uh, he lives, uh, he lives. Uh, Christ Jesus, uh, he lives today. Uh, he walks with me. Uh, he talks with me uh, along the lines of uh, narrow way. Uh, he lives. Uh, he lives. Uh, salvation uh, to impart. Uh, he asked me uh, how I know he lives. Uh, he lives uh, in my heart. Uh, and uh, because uh, he lives, uh, I can face uh, tomorrow uh, because uh, he lives. Uh, all fear uh, is gone uh, because uh, I know uh, he holds uh, the future uh, and life uh, is worth uh, the living uh, because uh, he lives. Uh, is there anybody here uh, other than me uh, know that he lives? Uh, if you know he really lives, uh, wave your hand uh, and say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. I know he lives. And because uh, I know he lives, uh, I know uh, the man is all right. Uh, is there anybody here other than me uh, can simply say, uh, ah.
reality every time I think about what the Lord has done for me it affects me it causes me to respond when I have to say nobody but you Lord nobody but you when I was in trouble you brought me Nobody but you, Lord. Nobody but you. I'm affected every time. I think about amazing grace, Reverend Brown. How sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. I don't know about you, y'all. But I was lost. But now I'm found. I was blind. But now I see God. I don't apologize for what God has done for me. Uh, the song is right. You don't know like I do what the Lord has done for me. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, other than me uh, that know what the Lord uh, has done for you? Uh, if you're in the house, uh, wave your hand. Uh, Say to answer the question somebody might be asking what is what is that what is this that makes you feel so good inside what is this that makes you want to run on anyhow they used to say whatever it is, but we know who it is. When you've been affected by him, he'll make you love your enemies, your friends, those who despitefully use you because you've been affected by the resurrection. I'm almost done with it. Let me make an appeal. Reverend, I, I took your advice. I took your advice. I remembered what you said. You said, even though I know the resurrection story, even though I've heard it, maybe you have even taught it, but you encourage me short of even warning me not to let the familiarity of the story rob you of its relevance for your life. If church not the body of Christ in its totality but if a local congregation has lost its draw, it may be because the people who are gathering are not being affected. They're not responding to what does say the Lord. Peter is a good example. Peter hung out with Jesus, told Jesus he would deny them. Now, 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 if that's a brother who hung out with Jesus, what about those who don't? Those 
you don't know it. My assignment, our assignment, from the moment you heard the prayer, from the moment the, the mass choir song, during the liturgical dance, it was all about you considering the question of the indisputable evidence. Because you don't respond, it doesn't mean the evidence is not indisputable. Oh, if I had time to give the microphone to everyone in this church who would be a witness to the fact that there was a time when I wasn't affected by the preaching of the word. Let me tell you something, and I'm done. Satan specializes in deception. I told you. Satan will have you serving God without ever asking the question if Jesus is missing. Now you've heard me, you've heard me talk about this because it's true. The unbeliever, of course, the unbeliever, there is nothing inside of you that's going to tell you other than the penal system to stop doing something that's wrong. There is nothing on the inside of you. You are a natural person subject to your own mind, subject to your own ideology. You can, you can quell your own conscience. You can have your own principles, your own set of rules. You can say for every bad thing you do, you're going to do two good things and feel good about yourself. That's a natural person. But when you have the presence of God on the inside, you and I just can't behave any kind of way. And anybody that tells us it's okay to do that, tell them, Pastor Stanley said, Jesus is missing. So I've... I've expended all God has given me. Going to ask every heart to stand both the lower level, if you can, and in the balcony. Here, here, here's all I want to say. Peter, impulsive, prone to error. John, Meditative and reflective. Peter showed up at the church. Peter heard the indisputable proof. The proof that Jesus is alive. Now, here it is. For those of you who, who need to see this, I'm going to show it to you. So everybody in the house, this is not a, this is not a, a non-serious moment. This is not a non-serious moment. Everyone in the house that know that Jesus is alive in your heart, raise your hand. You know he's alive. You know he is alive. every hand that is not raised I simply want to suggest to you this is the evidence that Jesus is alive this is the proof this is what Peter could not see but you can see this every hand down Every eye closed, listen to me very carefully. Reverend, I was just waiting for this moment. I realized that I've been presented 
indisputable evidence. Jesus is alive. In fact, I'm sitting next to someone. I'm in the front or the back of someone. And I don't want to leave this place unaffected. I don't want to be among that number that has been blinded by the world. I want to know Christ as the resurrected Savior. And if you are here, nobody's looking but you and I. If you know that you need to know Christ as Lord and Savior, just slip your hand on Jesus died for you. Jesus does not want you to go not only to another Easter service, but to any other service. And when the appeal for salvation is made, that you would have to raise your hand. Would there be one that would say, Reverend, I've been affected by the evidence. I don't know Christ in the part of my sin. And I want to know him in his resurrection power. With everyone, just raise your hand if you say, Reverend, I'm not going to leave this place without knowing him as Lord and Savior. I, I think I see a hand in the balcony. I'm not, is that a hand right, right there? My parents, the parents, you know your son, you know your daughter. Those of you who have raised your hand, you want to give your heart to Christ. You want to respond to the reality of the resurrection. Why don't you come? said, Reverend, I'm, I'm saved, but he talked about Peter and his failures and how sometimes when we don't do what God has called us to do, we fall into a place of what the scripture calls carnality. Saved, but we need to be dedicated to God. I told you that Resurrection Sunday is designed not only to expose individuals perhaps who've never heard resurrection narrative, but also to reacquaint us. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of what God has already done for us. If you're here, you say, Reverend, I need to be rededicated. I want to use this opportunity, this Resurrection Sunday. I want to respond by rededicating my life to Christ. If you fit that description, raise your hand. You're saved, but you just want to be rededicated. I see a hand. Rededication. Nobody wants to leave this place the same way they came. You know that there are some things in, of the world that's keeping you from being everything God has called you to be. Dedication. Can I see a hand of rededication? God 
bless you. If you don't mind, just walk down those stairs right there. Minister Habersham is going to meet you. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. This young man wants to dedicate his life to Christ. He's going to go with Minister Habersham. He's going to lead him into a perfect relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, for those in the virtual space, the Reverend, I want to be saved. I want to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not a very difficult thing to do. We talked about it in the sermon. The Word of God says if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The hard man believe unto righteousness, and the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Just simply repeat after me. Say, Father, I come before you a sinner. In need of salvation, I believe you sent your son Jesus that he died for my sins. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. You said in your word, if I will make this confession and express my belief, I shall be saved. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I confess him as Lord. You prayed that prayer, something simple. I'm here to tell you that you are saved. Don't let nobody tell you different. Get a chance to drop a line to the Hopewell Church. Let us know that you gave your heart to Christ so that we can continue, amen, to pray with you, amen, and for you. Come on, Hopewell, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Every heart standing, give me a half a second. Somebody said, Reverend, I am saved. I don't need to be rededicated. But I've been coming to the Hopewell Baptist Church, and I made up in my mind, today that I was going to make this my church home, a place where I would come not only to be in, to strengthen my faith, but also to strengthen my fellowship. If you are here, you desire membership of the Hopewell Baptist Church, let me tell you, you can come by letter Christian experience or as a candidate for baptism. I will submit to you what I'm sure all of my colleagues submit when they make these appeals. Hopewell is not a perfect church, but we are a healthy church. And we define healthy in this way. We believe in not only preaching the whole counsel of God, but striving to live as holy as sinners saved by grace believe. We understand that the words of Sister Bostic, that holiness is lofty, but it's achievable. And if you want to be a part of a body of baptized believers who are just trying to do it, like the Bible, you can come with everyone for membership. Amen. <laughs> God for you smoking us over. Amen. Maybe the Lord will touch your heart next time around. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. So happy to have you. So happy to have you. So happy to have you. Amen. Hope well. I want you to meet your new sisters and brother and brother and sisters. Meet your new family. Come on. Go ahead and get a motherly hug for my deaconess hall. All right, isn't that wonderful? Get a 
Sunday. Now, here are this week's announcements. Dear Sisters in Christ, join us for a special gathering. Sisters in Christ are Sisters for Life on Saturday, April 13th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Experience uplifting worship, inspiring testimonials, surprises, giveaways, and the opportunity to form lifelong connections. Celebrate the bond of sisterhood as daughters of Christ, sharing in faith, laughter, and support. This event is free, but please register in advance on our church website. The link is on Sister Stanley's March message. Please invite other fellow sisters in Christ. Let's rejoice in Christ's love and strengthen our bonds as sisters for life. We can't wait to share this beautiful day with you. Attention all members with last names starting with letters O and P. Next Sunday, Deacon and Deaconess Hall would like to meet with you after service on the left side of the church in front. Again, all members with last names ending in letters O and P. Please meet Deacon and Deaconess Hall next Sunday. Hope well, save the date. The HMBC Liturgical Dance Ministry presents Manifesting God's Power Through Dance on May 31st, 7 p.m. right here at Hopewell East. We can't wait to see you all there. Hopewell family, please remember that we fast every week from midnight on Monday night until noon every Tuesday. This week's Manna to Memorize is 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Please make sure to join our weekly Zoom gatherings and please stay connected. On Monday mornings, all of the men can join the men's prayer line promptly at 7 a.m. And on Monday evenings at 7 p.m., all of the women can join Sister Stanley with the Women's Christian Growth and Development class. On Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., the Men's Sharpening Men's Ministry meets for their Christian Growth and Development class, and all men are welcome to join them. Also on Wednesdays, you can join the Mission Ministry who meets every first and third Wednesday at 545 on conference call. The number is 978-990-5373. The code is 259-7230-POUND. Also on Wednesdays, after the first and third Sunday at 7 p.m., the Singles Ministry meets on Zoom. On Thursdays, after the second Sunday at 7 p.m., the Cuddles Ministry meets via Zoom. Our amazing senior citizens, our king and queen agers, also meet in person every Thursday at 10 a.m. in Hopewell West. And every Saturday morning at 7.55 a.m., all of the women can join the United Women's of Prayer Ministry and their prayer line. We would like to thank all first-time visitors for worshiping with us today. <laughs> 